All right, Doug, you are good to rock. Good morning, good evening, everyone at the Explorers Club. My name is Doug Woodring, the founder and managing director of Ocean Recovery Alliance. I'm calling live from Dubai this morning. But I'm on. My name is Doug. The ocean where uh, Aridin is rowing to. We are uh, part of the Westbound Rower Expedition. I'm an Explorers Club member, as is Aridin. And this is a flagged expedition, and it's the first of its type in the world because he's going across the Pacific Ocean from mainland to mainland north of the equator, which no one in the world has ever even attempted to our knowledge. Usually when you cross the Pacific Ocean, you go from uh, maybe California, take the currents and the trade winds and end up in uh, south of the equator, Papua New Guinea and Australia. So we've got an amazing show tonight because we've got Joe Grabowski here from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And what we're doing together is creating an ongoing education program for people of all ages, actually. Could be uh, maybe 10 to 100. Um, and it's everything ocean, exploration, survival, food, water, what happens when you lose your oar, uh, what's that shark doing next to my boat? Uh, how do the currents get me from uh, the Philippines through the South China Sea into Hong Kong? And Joe's got an amazing platform. We've had oh, thousands of kids already listening live to Airden like we're going to hear tonight. So, Joe, maybe you could say a few words about that because what we're doing together is really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Joe Gabreski. I'm calling in from Canada today, just outside of Toronto. Uh, and Exploring by Seat of Your Pants is a nonprofit that launched in 2015. So our goal is to inspire the next generation of scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists. We host up to 60 live events each month, connecting scientists and explorers with classrooms across North America. Uh, since 2015, we've probably run about 3,000 live events with a half a million students and scientists and explorers from over 95 countries joining in on the action. So I met Doug through the Global Biodiversity Festival, which is a fun event that we do uh, each year, bringing biodiversity live into everybody's homes in May. And uh, we started chatting and uh, how could we reach students? How could we get Airden in front of classrooms uh, through uh, Exploring by Seed Your Pants? So we've connected for several events uh, since Airden has struck off. We had a big event before he left where he showed us the boat, talked about some of his Guinness World Records, um, we had a big event when he arrived in Hawaii, which was another fun one. Uh, and we've had two now from, uh, the Pacific, uh, where he's joined via satellite phone. We've had, uh, pictures and little clips to share. And then we had, in the last one, Dr. Jay Barlow joined us from NOAA uh, and talked about beak whales and some of the science that Aaron is helping him do, uh, along the way, a little citizen science action. Yeah. So this is great. You know, usually when I go speak at schools, uh, our work at Ocean Recovery Alliance, I live in Hong Kong, and that's why we're on the support side of uh, the Asian side of Airden Trip. Um, we've been doing work for over 12 years on mainly plastic pollution, but other ocean issues. I've spoken at the Explorers Club in New York before um, during some of the big world ocean events there. But the point is, is to get everyone thinking about Airden's long trip, which is almost 10 months long. So that's a long period of time that we can have ongoing information flow to people. And we now have this in four languages and we put education content out every week on Westbound Wednesdays. And that's in English, Chinese, Spanish, and Turkish. And Turkish because uh, Erdin Erut is Turkish American. And so when I go speak at schools, it's usually one school, one class, you know, kind of an effort to get into the program, into the school, have the teacher provide time. They love it, but it's also just me and the one school. With, with Joe's platform, now we're getting 30 schools, 40 schools, 50 schools, all on the call at the same time from Canada, US, and now we're starting an Asian school program. And no one's seen this kind of platform where you can get all different schools engaged with the classrooms all on the same line with someone who's exploring the world from somewhere remote. So it's really neat stuff, Joe, and it's perfect for Explorers Club. And so Airden's been out. He's uh, 
left California in July and he's uh, now broken his 17th world record. Um, Aaron has actually been around the world once already, one of the first humans to ever go human power around the whole world, rowing and using his bike on the mainland. And he'll tell you a bit about that. That took about five years because he broke up his trip in different segments and avoiding the storm seasons, obviously, in different parts of the water. But uh, maybe we can show his tracker, Joe, and then I can explain a little bit. Erdin will come on shortly. <clears throat> we're we're going to introduce a bit now so he can get right into some of the action. But Erdin left from California. He's one of our ocean ambassadors at Ocean Recovery Alliance. Um, which is the NGO I mentioned I'm running out of Hong Kong, but we do global work. Uh, we've done work with the UN and the World Bank. And I met Erdin about five years ago uh, through the Turkish Olympic Committee after some work I did with a cross phosphorus swim in Istanbul. And they said, oh, you've got to meet Erdin. He's, uh, he's in the West Coast and he's planning another amazing expedition across the Pacific. You guys would get along really well. So we met about four or five years ago, ever since then, been very good friends. And here we are today. He launched, he made his journey happen, and he's on the way to see us in Asia. So he left California, but he had huge headwinds, or I should say onshore winds, uh, bringing him out of Crescent City. And instead of being able to sort of uh, go directly west, southwest on the map, I think we might have lost Doug sound there, Joe. Do you hear? Doug, we lost your sound there, mate. No, Doug, we lost you. Just kind of randomly lost this audio. Nope. Sorry, everyone, be patient with us here. We are talking to Doug live in Dubai and trying to get Erdin from the Pacific Ocean. So just a hiccup or two here. Doug, if you want to try to drop out and rejoin too, you're welcome to try that if all else fails. Still got nothing there. Okay, looks like he's going to drop out and come back in for us. Well, while we made a minute for that, uh, Erdin should be calling in shortly. He's either going to call via right into the Zoom, and if that doesn't work out well for him, he's going to call with his satellite phone right onto my cell phone, and I'll just relay that via speakerphone. I think we got Doug here. Looks like he's reconnecting now. Let's see how that works for us. Any luck, Doug? Still muted, it looks like. The magic of technology. We had him a moment <laughs> ago. Doug is a world traveler also, so he is beaming in from Dubai. Yeah, well, while we wait to see if Doug can connect, uh, let me just grab something from over here. So another great thing that Doug is doing through his organization, Ocean Recovery uh, Alliance, is having a little contest for the students. So after the students spend a little time meeting uh, Airden, uh, they then write uh, responses to questions. You know, what inspired you from your time with Airden? What changes are you gonna make uh, in your life? And then for the best entries that come in, we're sending them these beautiful pick-me-up bags. So these are created uh, through Doug's organization. And this is recycled uh, kite, material from kite surfers uh, and these are beautiful pick-me-up bags that you can beautiful straps here that you can bring along with you when you're hiking when you're out at the beach and you kind of always have that spot to kind of pick up what you're finding out on the trails or out uh, on the beach so very cool and a great use of recycled material here uh, with these bags 
And Joe, while we have you and are waiting for Doug here, can you tell us yes. a little bit more about Explore by the Seat of Your Pants and what you guys are doing aside from this particular program? Because I know you've done a lot with us in the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's just... Hello. There we oh, go. We got you, Doug. We're back. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, where were we? Airden. So two weeks out, he was going south to Mexico. Actually, almost gave up because he... He was going the wrong direction and he didn't want to hurt himself on the first part of his journey. So, but he made it, the winds died down. He got into the right uh, wind flow that he was looking for and headed off to Hawaii. You'll see going into Hawaii he has a little bit of a jagged edge there on the map because he ran into a huge storm. Um, and as you can imagine, when you're rowing, you actually are not going that fast. So it's not as if you can, bear north, south, east, or west and move away from an oncoming hurricane. So we had to batten down the hatches and uh, survive that. He actually was aiming to get to Hawaii to fix his solar powered water maker, desalinization water maker, and uh, almost couldn't do that because the storm almost swept him north of Hawaii, actually. But he made it. And he fixed his water maker and he got a few more provisions on board. And now he's back uh, traveling west from Hawaii. In fact, he said he, now he's almost going too fast. He was going in currents and uh, the wind was very uh, in his favor, very much in his favor. When you're rowing at uh, one or two knots and with a current, uh, you pretty much are in the God's hands of movement of the waters and the winds. And that's where we also have some great support from uh, Nikolai Maximenko and Jan Hoffner from the University of Hawaii, who are ocean current flow scientists. And I've known them for many years in working on plastic pollution issues and tracking that. Uh, so they're helping us with Airden's guidance and uh, where he's going, especially when he gets to the Luzon Strait. Uh, which is between the Philippines, north of the Philippines and south of Taiwan. Uh, once you get into the South China Sea at this time of year, which is this time of year, meaning February or March when Erdogan will be there, uh, the currents and the wind flows are strong. And uh, <clears throat> the, he needs to know basically how far north to go so he can slingshot into Hong Kong. Uh, if you think of the China coast, and you think of uh, the pinprick size that Hong Kong represents on that coastline, uh, it's a pretty tiny target that airden has got to try to reach going at a fairly slow speed as a rower um, across the ocean in uh, big currents and winds. So Doug, I'm just gonna jump in here. My uh, cell phone just went off. I have the man himself in the Pacific Ocean, Erden connecting here via satellite. Airden, hello. Hello there, Doug. Nice to see you again. Nice to hear you. I'm so glad. We're all so happy that you survived that storm. Let, let, let's you talk about that in a minute, but maybe give us a little bit of a background of what you've just been doing in the last hundred or so days. Well, to give a background, I am uh, rowing across the Pacific Ocean in partnership with Ocean Recovery Alliance, trying to draw attention to the plastic pollution in our oceans and the plight of all species uh, that suffer as a result of human activity. And this is an educational program. Uh, we have, you probably told everyone already, we have an educational stream of content in multiple languages going on. And I have also, um, set up a nonprofit around and over to educate and inspire children, especially. So this is all in uh, uh, unison. We are stepping forward with exploring by the seat of your pants, trying to reach classrooms, trying to inspire kids to take care of the Mother Earth. So this specific crossing is the first step on my way to uh, foothills of Everest. I am going to continue my bicycle from where I make landfall to Everest and then attempt to climb it, then carry on to Elbrus, then cross the Atlantic, carry on to Aconcagua. 
the East Summit is part of the six summits project that I have going on in memory of Yaron Krupp, who, whom I lost while rock climbing together back in 2002. He had bicycle from Sweden to Nepal in 96, climb that first. And so far I have done three of the summits. What remains are, uh, what remain are Everest, Albus, and Aconcagua. Um, I have, I left with 15 US world records. I now have 17. When I make landfall uh, on mainland Asia, I will have registered two more. And uh, it's been uh, rough going. I had a storm within the last week that gave me a knockdown, cost me two spare oars, caused some damage, but it won't stop coughing. The coughing continues. Uh, trying to get to Mariana's by the second half of January to time my crossing across the Philippine Sea to Luzon Straits between Philippines and Taiwan, which is treacherous waters. And then once through that conflict, then uh, my struggle will be to make landfall at Hong Kong. I'm guessing second half of March, mid March to end of March is when I will make landfall. All right. Great. Well, Erdan, I have a few of your photos up right now uh, that I'm going to go scroll through a couple of them and then maybe we'll get you to comment on a few of them. Um, Doug kind of touched on this a little bit, but after you you left California, we've got the map up right now to show kind of the routes that you were pulled on. You had a bit of a struggle getting out there to, to get on the course you wanted. Yes, I. It was, this is an interesting year. And in fact, I'm still suffering from it right now. The uh, jet stream had set farther uh, from where it normally does, and it had a lot of northwest winds uh, while trying to break away from California shores. I almost gave up and routed to San Diego or Ensenada, and eventually I was able to break free. So it was a struggle to stay clear of, get clear of U.S. Uh, continental shores. Then uh, right now I have long fetch uh, well coming in from the northeast and east northeast and that's a result of a high pressure system that left Siberia and Mongolia and extended very far east and is creating a lot of strong winds and that is also due to a jet stream that is misplaced for the south. Yeah. Uh, these are difficult problems. So our first big connection uh, after you had left, after our first event, was when you reached Hawaii. Uh, what did you get up to when you got there? Uh, would you repeat the second part of that? Yeah, uh, when you reached Hawaii, uh, what kind of things did you have to do? You took a little bit of time. What were you doing during that time? Yes, yes I had to uh, replace my chart water. I had to make new flaps for my scuppers to drain water properly. They were falling apart. Um, there were, a uh, water maker was giving me trouble. Uh, it's, the air kept getting into the system. Uh, so I had to resolve that. A few things that I had to do, including trying to attempt yet again, getting a visa to China. Due to the pandemic, they had denied a visa since March, last March. So that remains a challenge right now. That's something we're working on right now. And uh, also trying to get an exemption from quarantine because uh, Airden's obviously been at sea for, will have been for six months solo, which is probably the longest quarantine in the world for a lot of people, unless you've been to space. And uh, we wouldn't want him to get into a hotel right when he gets back for three weeks. Erdin, we have a quick question here. Uh, we talked about your um, circum your crossing of the Pacific north of the equator. Someone asked about Peter Bird in 1983-84 uh, being the first crossing. I think you know Peter. Uh, Peter Bird rode from San Francisco, stopped at Hawaii, carried on to Australia uh, to the Great Barrier Reef. That was his long crossing, and then he had made multiple attempts to row from Vladivostok East to North America, uh, which would have been the first mainland to mainland crossing. Uh, all other departures from Asia were from Japan. 
So in that quest on his fourth try, I believe, he was lost at sea in 96. So that's Peter Bird's story, and I carry Peter Bird's logo on my rowboat. Wow. So um, as part of the Explorers Club and carrying the flag, we do education or you do education, citizen science. So I mentioned the work with the University of Hawaii, but I didn't say what you were doing with them, with the ground truthing and the satellites. And also maybe you could ask, talk a bit about your work with Jay Barlow and Noah and the beaked whales. Yes. Uh, we earned the flag expedition status, flag number 97 from the Explorers Club after my collaboration with uh, Dr. Jay Barlow, a NOAA scientist, uh, was confirmed. I carry a hydrophone for Dr. Barlow, and when conditions allow, I carry that hydrophone. It's a high-frequency recording device that gathers sounds of uh, ambient sounds. And he can analyze that for various uh, types of whales. He specifically is looking for beaked whales and uh, he's going to be scanning the same for sperm whales as well. And the unique thing about these whales is they don't hunt near the surface to avoid orcas. They go deep and then they use echolocation to locate birds and such to feed. So this uh, hydrophone captures that kind of activity. Um, and with uh, the, how about the ground protein and the satellite? Uh, the educational uh, activity beyond that is uh, bonus, obviously. Right. So you you do some ground truthing with satellite imagery as well, because uh, Jan and Nikolai are looking for different current flows where you might even find plastic in a tide line. And I think you're able to go to some pinpoints where they're looking at the water from the air to see if what they're seeing is actually uh, the real thing. Is, you already hit one of those spots, is that right? Yes, uh, what they are using is uh, the star, um, simple aperture the Sentinel. radar, I believe it was called. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so far. It's a special satellite, uh, Sentinel-2 is the one, uh, that uh, sends a radar, a microwave, off to the surface and then analyzes the scattered data so it can get, it can penetrate cloud cover and such and gather information about what's on the surface. And uh, I was given a target, uh, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer uh, there, I need to be in, and I was able to pretty much move by that. Uh, and once in it, then I was able to provide them feedback about surface condition, uh, wave pattern, uh, wavelength, and height, and such. Uh, they were trying to locate my boat in that, and then uh, we we're still waiting to get the specific data whether they could see my rover. All right. And so, so someone asked, uh, we had a picture up about one of the Coast Guard explore, the uh, Coast Guard cutters. And so the question is, do you have any uh, support boats on your journey? And we, I always get this question and people just can't believe uh, whether you do or don't. So what, what happened when the Coast Guard boat came I, out to visit you? I don't have a support vessel. They would get bored out of their minds. I move at uh, walking pace, <laughs> knots or so is my average. So no, it would be too expensive and prohibitive. So the idea is to make these crossings unsupported without help from other vessels taking or giving things other than information, really. So the cutter came out just to see uh, that you're okay because you were in the waters of Hawaii when you were leaving. They came to just pay you a courtesy visit, I think. Uh, Joe, would you repeat that? Uh, Doug? The sound comes across. Yeah, echoes to me. Doug was just saying that uh, you had a visit from the Coast Guard uh, shortly after leaving Hawaii. They came just yes. to kind of check up, say hi. Yes, my ground team has, in, it has been in touch with the Joint Rescue Coordination Center in Honolulu. 
Um, they tracked my course as well as the track of a uh, hurricane that formed uh, southeast of me and tracked toward me, and I had to stay out of its way. Um, on the approach to Hawaii, they were close to following me, and then uh, we got to meet, they got to see the rowboats, they got to meet me, and uh, got a sense of what my level of preparation was, and they were relieved, I think, and I was probably able to launch from there. My ground team is now in touch with uh, the uh, Rescue Coordination Center in Guam now, and uh, I am just south of Wake Island, and I am still in the uh, area of responsibility of Honolulu. If anything went uh, sideways, uh, what Honolulu would do would be to fly resources to Wake Island, and uh, so that's within 100 miles, 80 miles, I think, north of me right now. I have to check. And then they would come to me and fly me to Wake Island and then sort from there. That is the procedure at this time. Uh, these things change as I am further away from land. Well, Erdin, you said if things go sideways, uh, I think you did go sideways a bit the other day. What what did you go through? That sounded like a crazy event. Yes, uh, I was in the cabin uh, the night of the storm just uh, a few days ago, and uh, the wind was blowing hard from the southeast. I had established swells from the northeast, so I had a falling of waves. And the wind started changing direction to east-southeast, which meant that the boats turned with the winds, but uh, now it was broadside to jump waves from the previous southeast winds. One of those waves came and just crashed into my rowboat, uh, caused some damage, cost me two spare oars. Uh, I was tied to the mattress on purpose, to make sure that I keep the center of mass low. The worst thing that can happen is uh, I would be thrown at the ceiling and sitting on the ceiling in an, an upturned vessel that shifted ballast and then the boat will never right itself. So I was tied down for seeing such a scenario and the boat went over about 150 degrees, I guess. Uh, everything got rearranged in the uh, cabin. Then uh, it came back up. The deck was full of water, and that emptied, and then uh, I had to figure out what damage there was, and basically stay tied down until the morning before I could do anything else. Wow, and you lost an oar or two, I think, that broke off uh, when that wave hit. Is that true? Uh, two oars, yes. Uh, my spare oars are tied on top of oar stands on either side of the vessel. And uh, with the force of the wave, which had to be higher, uh, possibly five feet or six feet higher than the side of the rowboat, just rushing in at whatever the speed it had, 30 miles an hour probably, and uh, just shoved the oar stand in on the port side where the uh, wave hit, and on the other side, as it went over, it uh, snapped the lines that I had used to tie the oars. And so two spare oars, uh, I had to, uh, it, it just got away from me to the sea. And uh, there was one that remained by one cord knocking on the side of the boat. I checked, and the conditions were so rough, the hatch opened, I wasn't gathered, I didn't have my PFP on while verifying what was going on. I had no way of pulling that in, short of stepping outside. So I took the knife and cut that cord and let it go to the bottom. So I am down two spare oars. I started out with two pairs extra. So now I have my rowing oars and an extra pair. So and things are okay. I will still continue. Damage is minimal. That won't stop the coughing. Wow, that's amazing. We're so happy that you're all right. So we have some wildlife photos here with a bird and the shark visit. And the kids always ask, what have you seen out at sea? Did you see plastic? And what are you experiencing? So what are some of the animals you've come across so far? 
I see a lot of sooty terns. They are very active. They're everywhere. Uh, they're private species. I see frigate birds uh, quite far out. Uh, they soar high and uh, look out for any uh, activity by the sooty terns that are they get quite excited and noisy when they spot any action on the water. Uh, the action they're looking for is a dorado or tuna uh, chasing flying fish. So as the flying fish is being chased, it breaks the surface, and when it's flying, the birds get it. Uh, so flying fish are bird uh, food for everyone. Um, wow. Uh, so and I saw shearwaters and a lot of boobies as well, red footed boobies, and a... I saw a mast booby the other day, and there's one that, uh, and brown booby also. It looks like a penguin with a white chest and black back. Uh, the rest, <laughs> uh, it is a booby. And there's one species I don't recognize that is a type of booby that has a bluish gray feet and a bit darker coloring. I'll have to look it up, uh, find out. And the shark, you had a shark come visit you. Yeah, I had uh, mostly white tip sharks that have come to visit. So they are a smaller variety, making up to about six feet or so, maybe seven. And uh, they have come and visited, stayed with the boats, faced with the boats. Any the instinct of any smaller fish is to stay in the shade or behind. Uh, a larger fish, so they get to feed on the morsels uh, coming off its mouth or, or from behind it. Um, and also, the boats and larger fish provide shade. So those are those are the benefits of tracking a larger creature like that. And my boat makes a good substitute. Well, speaking about food, someone has asked, what do you do? What do you eat in the rowboat? And I think we had a picture of your Thanksgiving dinner here. How do you, how do you survive at sea for such a long time? Uh, my main staple is freeze-dried foods. Uh, they come in pouches. And I have solar panels that charge two batteries. Uh, I have 220 gigawatt batteries uh, total and about 290 watts of uh, solar capacity. So my batteries are always topped up. Uh, make water using an electric desalinator and then uh, use a handheld butane stove to camping stove to boil water to reconstitute the food. That's my main staple. I have other selections like dried fruits and nuts and raisins and stuff. So that's really how I get across in a one a day will vitamin pill. <laughs> Just make sure I have a little gas. So, Erdin, another question that I see coming up here uh, from Steve. Steve is wondering, how did you get into long distance rowing? What got you started on this sport, this amazing endeavors? I mentioned, sure, I mentioned uh, Yaron Krop. Uh, I met him in the summer of 2001. I had this idea of uh, human powered circuit navigation ever since 97. Uh, and I had been talking about it, never started. He had encouraged me, and when I had the accident, I said, okay, I'm going to do the certain navigation and uh, do the Vectra Summit on his, in his memory. So in my plans for certain navigation, I had been looking at the world's map and saying, how do I get across these oceans? So one of the solutions I found was a, an ocean rowing um, source, Ocean Rowing Society based in London, they had used rowboats. I got one of those, and then uh, that's how I got into it. One thing led to another uh, to be able to complete my five-year circumnavigation between 2007 and 2012, which, by the way, earned me a citation of merit in 2013 from the Explorers Club. Uh, uh, I had to cross these oceans. So at this point, with all the rowing that I have done, uh, during circumnavigation and Atlantic crossing before that, and what I've done until now, I am leading the world in solo one total days road, uh, solo distance road, and overall uh, days road. I have 
just about a thousand days uh, in solo rowing, 900 some, and it's about 1,100 overall. So that's a lot of time on the water, about three years of my life spent on the sailboat. Uh, Erdin, speaking of the storm, someone's just asked, what are the largest waves you've experienced so far? And I guess that could be in your lifetime of uh, journeys, just because you probably have had them on a few of your crossings. The uh, biggest waves I see are about 15 feet or so. Um, what I make sure is to stay and get on the water outside of storm season. Uh, the problem with the Pacific is, is, is that it is so such a large body of water, one has to uh, encounter storms along the way. But on smaller oceans like Atlantic and even Indian, uh, one can be on the water outside of storm seasons and minimize that kind of exposure. The biggest seas I see are about 15 feet or so doesn't get bigger than that unless road waves, random road waves, uh, show up. They haven't yet. Um, so, so I remember it. And it can be, it can be knocked down easily, uh, relatively easily. It writes itself quite readily. The weight distribution is such that the center of mass is low. Cabin, as long as it's not flooded, provides buoyancy. It writes itself. Uh, it goes sideways, comes right back up. I've never gone 360 full roll. So, Erdin, uh, I remember about a few months ago, I, I, I texted you and said, you know, there was an earthquake off of Japan um, and there's a tsunami warning. Uh, what would happen if there was a tsunami when you're in the middle of the ocean? Uh, the... Uh, the interesting thing with tsunamis, and much like all forms of waves, is that out in the open ocean, uh, the behavior of the waves will be more flat and long and high speed. And then it will re-erupt and get taller as it reaches shallow ground. So where I am right now is just over 5,000 meters deep. Uh, that's over 16,000 feet. And I am just getting past the mid-Pacific seamounts uh, that came up to about 1,500 meter depth or so from 5,000. Um, these uh, would not be noticeable out in the big ocean like this at the depth. So uh, tsunamis are not a concern for me. Uh, those that live by the seashore should worry more. Right. So, Erdin, uh, going back to the food that you eat, uh, we've had a, always questions from the kids about fish and eating fish. But you said you don't eat fish very much. Well, why don't you eat fish when you're at sea? Well, uh, the one thing about fish is if I can pick up a fish that I would have to uh, bring it out. Uh, on deck, uh, watch it die, and once past that trauma, I have to sit there and uh, clean it, and then I have to prepare it, I have to boil it, I have to set up a whole kitchen where, uh, where I need to cook this thing. So it's a long process, laborious process, and uh, it's... In the conditions that I'm in right now, and that are just uh, 12 foot waves from that 10 second period, uh, right now as I'm talking to you, I'm getting slammed by the waves. Uh, it's just not conducive to uh, life on a small rowboat. I have done it before. If I want to catch a small fish, I put out a small hook, and then a larger fish comes and gets it, and then snaps the line. If I put out a heavier line and a larger hook, I necessarily catch a large fish. Then I don't have refrigeration, and I can't eat all of it. After three helpings or so, I have to dump uh, what I don't eat at sea, which is a waste of a life that I haven't totally consumed. So I just don't like the idea that I should catch fish. If flying fish ends up on my deck, if I have the patience for it and if it's a good size, I may clean it and add it into my breakfast. It's enough. Uh, the, the boiling water 
well, my scrambled eggs is hot enough to cook through that small fish. So that's about the extent of my uh, fish diet. Okay. So do we have any other questions from the, uh, from the floor out there? Yeah. Well, Aaron, probably, how long? Go ahead, Joe. I was just going to say, we'll probably only have Aaron for another couple of minutes. So if there are some questions out there, uh, now's the time to get them in before we have to lose the satellite connection. So Aaron, we look forward to seeing you in March. Yeah. Uh, when you get to Asia, we're going to have a very big welcome for you. Uh, assuming you can get into Hong Kong and on to the next part of your journey. But uh, we've got, we're building a great following. <laughs> and, you know, from around the world, we're about to really move into the Spanish and the Turkish momentum on, in the languages for the, for, the, for the education. So hopefully people from the Explorers Club can reach out to people in different countries they know who can just start tracking and watch Erdogan's sort of weekly updates, not only his blog, which is amazing, but also the education that uh, my colleague Ryan Chung in Hong Kong is helping write and that some of our colleagues are translating that each week. So we have a question here from Steve. Does he seat himself in the boat and bob around like a washing machine until the storm subsides? Uh, I think you, you referenced that you were strapped to your bed, but maybe you can explain that a bit a little bit more and the ballast in the way that you don't want to flip over and in on the roof. Sure, uh, I have four uh, eyes that are bolted inside the cabin. Uh, two are on either side of my waist on the other side of the cabin and two are by my shoulders on the bulkhead. When I tie myself on the mattress, I take a line and uh, cross it across my chest and then one goes across my waist. I have a harness, just a belt of a climbing harness I took with me, and I tie that, pinch it, and so I won't move side to side as much, and I won't come off the mattress. So if a uh, wave leaves the boat, I will not slide to the lower side, or if it just rolls the boat, I won't end up on the ceiling. As I was suggesting, if I am on the ceiling, other than cutting open my forehead, a lot of mud everywhere, uh, <laughs> I would end up on the ceiling of an upturned vessel with no way of levitating me back up to the mattress, and I would be shifted ballast, anchoring the boat upside down. I need to let the boat roll through if it does go over so that the... Um, Writing moments can actually work. If it is upside down and sit, sitting there, the force going up and force coming down will be in line and the writing moment will, will be as large. Uh, the best time to recover is as it's sideways when the writing moment is largest. So that's why I need to stay on the mattress and not go lay on the ceiling. Uh, uh, that would be the worst case scenario. If that did happen, then uh, the only way out of that pickle is to open the hatch, uh, flood the cabin, get outside. The, once the cabin is flooded, it will never ride itself. Uh, and I would have to uh, basically run the e-perm and seek rescue. Uh, that'll be the end of the coffee. And you have a small lifeboat there, I believe. So you would get into that lifeboat. Um, speaking of all this, uh, and the, for the people who might not be on the ocean much, do you actually get seasick through all of this? Or are you so, such a veteran to the ocean that I you don't get seasick? A, I have a four person offshore life raft and the e bird to call rescue. So I am set up for that kind of a emergency. And do you get seasick ever, Erden, in all your journeys? I'm sorry? Uh, seasickness, uh, Erden. No. Have you ever, uh, in some of the rough conditions, been seasick? Uh, I don't get seasick anymore. My lizard brain has learned 
the behavior, the movement of this vessel. I don't get seasick anymore. I do get sea legs when I get to land, and that lasts about 36 hours or so, especially when I'm head down tying my shoes or something. Um, uh, I, I did get seasick early on when I started with this rowboat. Uh, that was back in 2005, but uh, I haven't since. So someone asked, are you near the shipping channel, and how do you keep yourself warned from vessels when you're sleeping? Joe, help me, please. Yeah. So uh, one question was, are you near the shipping channels? And then the other question was a bit about your sleep. Uh, how, how do you manage it? How do you know if a ship is approaching? Uh, I am, well, let's say this. Uh, during the storm a week ago, I, the nearest ship was uh, about 200 miles away, and there were multiple ships 300 miles away. So the shortest distance from the Philippines to Honolulu is a great circle arc that reaches above my location. So these vessels tend to follow that for the shortest distance. And because of the storm that passed north of me, they also came south. Uh, so there were multiple vessels nearby around me. And the way that I make myself visible at night is by uh, a 360-degree white navigation light that basically says, this is a vessel at anchor, go around it, don't hit it, <laughs> or you're approaching another vessel from behind. So those, those are the meanings of a white light. When another vessel sees that, they will necessarily go around it according to the navigation rules. I also have what's called an AIS, Automatic Information System, Automated Information System, where I see where other vessels are, and they see where I am. And if there's a risk of collision, the system alerts me on the chart bar saying this is the closest distance of approach for this vessel uh, coming towards you. Be aware. So the alarms go off, and it doesn't go off on the other side as well. So I can raise another vessel by name. I see it and uh, call them on the radio and uh, ask for course correction, and they will do that anyway when they see another vessel on their path. Um, they also have an active radar target enhancer. It's an electronic device. My vessel is very small and plywood, so it doesn't reflect radar signals well. Uh, what this does is it sees the radar signal and then responds back makes me visible on their radar screen if their radar is running. Um, so that's another tool that I have in uh, rainy conditions, for example. Uh, so those are the okay. tools that I have that make me visible at night. And during the day, it's more visual than the AIS. So, Erdin, you have a water machine on your boat for desalinization, uh, fresh water not only for drinking and cooking, but also for washing and keeping your skin uh, clean. Can you explain a bit about that and the need for that when you're at sea for such a long time? Yeah, the, the water maker, the desalination unit is a critical piece of equipment. It needs to keep working for me to make a safe crossing. I have a handheld uh, spare one as well, but I'd rather be rowing than pumping by hand, uh, especially in this flashy seas. You just cannot keep up with the need to rinse things. Um, the desalination unit uses a reverse osmosis process. It presses the seawater against a very tight membrane and this is at the molecular level now. Pump molecules are larger than water molecules. And this membrane then sweats over water on the opposite side, and that gets collected and it goes into my drinking water containers. So uh, this electrical device we, uh, works up 800 psi or so, a very high pressure system. And uh, as long as it's working, it can make up to six to eight liters of water, which is pretty much what I need every day. 
I use that to reconstitute my food, to drink water, and I bought it uh, off and rinse the salt water that splashes on me. Uh, I rinse my clothes uh, of the sweat and the salt clay that I have on them. Uh, salt is a very irritating substance that can cause basically it cooks the skin. Uh, whenever you make a jerky or dry fish or anything, you would put salt on it to desiccate it, really. And that's the kind of effect it has on the skin unless it is regularly rinsed off. Uh, salt boils are not comfortable, very itchy. Um, so those are the uses of water that I have. Any other questions there? Erdin, you've been amazing. And, uh, you know, we we had Jay Barlow on talking about the beak whales. We're going to have uh, Nikolai and some other special guests uh, in your journey into uh, the South China Sea. But um, do you have any questions or things you'd like to say to the Explorers Club? One of the last questions here is how do you avoid the sunburn? Do you row in the night or how do you how do you manage the heat there? Joe? Yeah. Question? Yeah, Erdin, how do you manage the heat? How do you avoid sunburn? Uh, the sunburn, uh, well, as long as there are clouds, I'm comfortable. Right now, the heat is the issue. It's very sweltering inside the cabin as I'm talking to you. Um, I have uh, non oily sunscreen that I can spray on, but I don't like to put on that stuff. I minimize the use of it. I can sometimes uh, spray it on my shins and feet. I am rowing with long sleeve shirt outside and a large brim hat. Basically, I cover up. And then uh, my legs are exposed. Most of my legs are in the shade of my body as I work the uh, rowing uh, movement and uh, what gets most exposed are my shins and my tops of my feet so those can get some uh, um, some spray otherwise some protection otherwise I don't use it um, you just go for it <laughs> so Erdan I think Doug was was asking if you maybe had uh, a final message or anything you wanted to say to the, you know, the Explorers Club who's tuning in right now. Yes, uh, I am proud to be carrying the club flag. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to contribute to science uh, in the small way that I can as the weather allows. I think we need to do a follow-up uh, expedition where we do a round-the-clock uh, recording of these sounds for whales using a sailboat. Um, it's very difficult on a rowboat. Um, I am happy to be part of the club and part of this culture. It's wonderful. You know, we look forward to seeing you in Hong Kong. There's a Explorers Club Hong Kong chapter, uh, which has started about five years ago. And everyone's excited to see you there. Uh, for everyone else who's uh, able to reach out on the education side. Maybe you have uh, kids or friends who, with children who'd like to be part of uh, one of these calls with Airden in the future. We have live classroom video, which uh, Joe's platform allows for, and then all the other schools, we can do about eight schools at a time live with video. And then the rest come on on a live YouTube link and that's also always recorded. So if you look back at exploring it by the seat of your pants, there's a lot of uh, some of the previous videos with Airden and the talks with the kids. And it's so it's so inspiring, even for me, Airden, when all the kids get up in the classroom and uh, Joe says, say hi to Airden. And they all wave and cheer. And, you know, you can hear them cheering you across the ocean. It's pretty neat. Estimated mileage of crossing aired in the last question, and then we can let you go. Oh, I think I, I think we lost him early. It looks like he just disconnected. Okay, so we've got, he's doing almost 8,000 miles um, on this crossing uh, based on, you know, the, the, the,
direction he goes and the uh, avoidance of storms and things, but it's a pretty long trip. Uh, he's, he will be expected in the South China Sea in about February, mid-February, and then he'll be aiming for the coast in Hong Kong. Uh, he has plan B. If it seems like the currents and the winds don't allow him to get to Hong Kong, he will travel another 800 miles uh, southwest to Vietnam and plan to come into Vietnam um, also on the mainland of Asia. And from there, he will ride his bike uh, to the Nepal side of Mount Everest and climb Mount Everest. If he can get into Hong Kong and have a permit to get into China at that time, he would ride his bike through mainland China and climb Mount Everest on the China side of Mount Everest. After that, he will ride to Europe and actually row across the Atlantic into South America. So this is actually the beginning of a longer journey, but uh, this is a huge, huge piece of it. And, and that's why we're focusing really right now on the, on the cross Pacific westbound rower challenge. So we hope you've all had a great. Uh, so Doug, just to jump in quick, I've got Aaron called back. He reconnected. So he just wants to kind of thank everybody and, and give a sign off. Great. All right, Erdogan, you're back on. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for reconnecting me. My satellite phone can drop out yeah, unexpectedly every now and then. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, Explorers Club for hosting me, uh, giving me the opportunity to address uh, them and uh, any classrooms that may have connected through uh, Exploring by the Seat of Japan. And Doug, uh, thank you so much for being a great partner. You've been enthusiastic from the get-go, and I am looking forward to making the landfall at Hong Kong so we can all celebrate and take a deep sigh of relief. Uh, <laughs> it'll be good times once I make like, the landfall. Uh, yeah, you. we'll have a course, we'll have a lot. Follow me at westboundrover.com, or you can share my website with them. Yep. And Aaron's, you know, looking always needs funding for this and our projects and his, his work. So there's a GoFundMe site on those links. And if you're able to contribute, that always helps. Uh, we've had uh, some support from Schroeder's in Hong Kong, who's helped with some of our education, ongoing education work. And, you know, this is a great thing. Once he crosses the Pacific, it's going to be ongoing, as we mentioned. So Hopefully the momentum of the students and the teachers, the classrooms can continue on this journey. And uh, maybe we don't always talk about the ocean, but then we start talking about freshwater, uh, forests, land, mountains, you know, storms. And this is all stuff that people don't always uh, learn from in the classroom. So the Explorers Club and Exploring by Your Seat of Your Pants offer really neat ways to... Uh, get uh, outdoor education without getting wet, without getting sweaty, but you can follow people who are just doing amazing things. So we really appreciate it. All right. So I think uh, Aaron is logged off from the sat phone. Uh, sounds like he's having a hot time there uh, in the cabin and dealing with some of those waves right now. I think he said they're about 12 feet right now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, I've been out in some of those waves just on near the coastlines, and I can only imagine what it must be like being strapped into that bed uh, at nighttime in the dark, just rolling around and having no idea second to second, uh, you know, what side you're going to end up on. It's amazing. Yeah. And I think as, as we're kind of getting close to logging off here, Doug, there's just a message here just to share that uh, next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, they're streaming Giraffes on a Raft, the silent extinction of the giraffe, the story of the rescue of the giraffe with David O'Connor. So that sounds like another water themed event. And uh, I'm sure uh, Aaron would definitely not like a giraffe on his little sailboat with him right now, but or his little rowboat. But uh, sounds like a great event coming up next week. Yeah. So a couple of things, uh, you know, in the, that are coming up in the future, we'll be talking a bit more about wildlife and uh, Overfishing, there's a great report that's come out um, supported by a group in Hong Kong and the University of British Columbia 
on South China Sea fisheries uh, and the uh, you know impact that overfishing is having. And Airden will see some of that. And I think one of the reasons he doesn't eat a lot of fish, uh, along with the reasons he mentioned, he doesn't want his boat dirty, he doesn't have refrigeration. But uh, there's less fish in the ocean. 80% of the big fish are gone, overfished. The world's fishing fleets are huge and higher technology. They go farther afield to catch less fish deeper in the ocean. And I think Airden, uh, you know, sees, sees a lot less of that than he would have in the, in the days before that. So all of these things are kind of linked and we can bring these messages through these kind of events and what he's experiencing. So unless there's questions for Joe or I, I think we'll um, we'll call that a good session with the Explorers Club and hopefully we might be able to do it again, maybe when he gets to shore before he goes up Everest. And uh, look forward to seeing some of you out there in the new world.